On Two Wheels this week, Jeff and I continue our look back at some of the most impressive bikes of the 1990s. And for those of you keen on riding through the winter, Jeff has a sensible alternative to the more common sports bike. Also this week, Wayne looks at the kind of leathers available for lady bikers. And we've a very important announcement for those of you watching us through an analog satellite system. On two wheels last week, we looked at some of the most impressive sports bikes of the 1990s. We talked about the Kawasaki ZZR 1100 and Yamaha's 1000cc Exum. There was the Honda Fireblade, not to mention Ducati's 916 and of course the awesome R1. And we left off with a look at Yamaha's best-selling 600cc, the R6. So if we're talking about 600cc sports bikes, we should really mention Suzuki's GSX-R 600. And whilst it might be one of the best looking race replicas you can buy, it's certainly not one of the most popular. It doesn't sell anywhere near as well as the CBR, Kawasaki ZX6 and of course Yamaha's R6. And I think the problem with it is it's just too focused, it's a bit too radical. It's certainly the least comfortable of the 600s, there's not a lot of room on this seat, so even short riders will get backache after well, perhaps a couple of hours in the saddle. And the engine, it's a bit too revvy really for using everyday kind of thing. You've got to have it spinning at something like seven and a half, eight thousand revs plus to find any decent usable power. It means it's great on a racetrack, straight lines where you can thrash it and chuck it out of corners, superb. But around town, not really ideal, which is probably why it hasn't quite got the sales of the rest. Now, all the Japanese bikes that we featured up until now, they've all been four cylinders. But in 1997, Honda, a bit concerned that the way Ducati were beating the RC45 on the track, thought they needed a V-twin as well. So they came up with this, the VTR1000 Firestorm. V-twin, 90 degree V-twin at that, just like a Ducati, but a much sort of simpler bike. In other words, pretty standard other than that, nothing exceptional to it. It had side mounted radiators was something new that we'd seen also had a very small petrol tank and in fact this bike has become renowned for its small range you know you can be lucky to get 110 miles out of a tank full which can be a bit of a bind in fact that's probably on the generous side 90 miles is something more like it but nevertheless it's a light and nimble bike very popular easy to ride very flexible and of course it's got that honda reliability now while honda had the firestorm suzuki weren't going to be outdone in this v-twin battle so they bought out this the tl1000s again in 1997 big 90 degree v-twin but this fuel injected not carbs like the firestorm nice looking bike you've got this twin tube frame here very much like a triumph 595 but this had a terrible reputation in the early days in some sectors of the media the bike press for getting into a tank slapper. This was because it was light on the front end and the bars would start to wave and so it was reputed people were killed. But whether that's true or not, I don't know, it's one of those things that never really bottomed out. And talking about bottoming out, one of the problems was supposed to be the rather novel rear suspension. It used a rotary damper and the idea was it didn't give quite enough compliance and so you used to be able to lift up the front end far too easy. There have been some mods done to them. Ron Williams of Maxton Engineering did a mod, and in fact, we went up there to see him with a TL1000S. But it was still a nice bike to ride, a lot of feel, a lot of character to it. But to address some of these concerns, Suzuki then came out the next year with the TL1000R. And even though they didn't admit to any mistakes, they completely changed the frame and completely changed the rear suspension. It also had a lot more weight in having this big fairing, so there was more weight over the front wheel. But again, with this one, same as Honda, they had aspirations to go world superbike racing with this, but they didn't really make it. Unlike Honda, of course, with the SP1, and they did make it. Now, during the 1990s, three different manufacturers have held the title of world's fastest production bike. At the start of the 90s, Kawasaki owned the title with their ZZR 1100. Then Honda came along with the CBR 1100XX, the Super Blackbird, and that was the fastest production bike. Then in 1999, the title was taken by Suzuki because they launched this, the GSX 1300R Hayabusa. Strange name and a very strange looking bike, as far as some people are concerned. Certainly a very different looking bike. I think it's catching on a little bit now. People are starting to accept it, but it was slagged off terribly when it came out. People said, oh my God, that shouldn't look like that. Sports bike shouldn't look like that. It is incredibly fast. 190 something miles an hour is the claimed top speed. Nobody seems to be exactly sure what the top speed is. There are rumours of higher buses being clocked at 200 miles an hour and even 200 miles an hour plus. 
All I can say is when I attended the world launch uh, to the Catalonia race circuit in Barcelona, I managed to get it up to 175 miles an hour and that was quite fast enough. Things go past your face very, very fast at 170 miles an hour. I actually won an award about 18 months ago from the uh, motorcycle press and it was called Sports Tourer of the Year. Now, is it a sports tourer? Is it a sports bike? What exactly is it? I'm not really sure what category it fits into. It's certainly got the performance to keep up with any sports bike, although it hasn't got the agility and the nimbleness of like your GSX-Rs and your R1s and R6s and even your Fireblades. But it's certainly a very, very fast bike. And at the moment, as we speak, nothing can beat it on speed. And I'd have to agree with that because Paul and I have often discussed this top speed thing and by golly, 190 mile an hour, isn't that plenty fast enough for anyone? But when Kawasaki brought out this, the ZX-12R, the rumours were of a 200 mile an hour motorbike. Now it didn't do it, as you probably know, it didn't reach that magic 200 miles an hour. I tested it, thought it was an absolutely fantastic bike, but I didn't do 200 mile an hour either, needless to say, because it was on UK roads. But nevertheless, it's a fast bike, and now all bikes in the European Union, they're all regulated to 180. So we've probably seen the end of the speed wars. And all I'd say to you, I think, that if 180 mile an hour isn't fast enough for you, you may as well buy an aeroplane. OK, Paul, we all set? Uh, we are, but we haven't even mentioned the GSX-R 750. That's true. But then again, there's other Suzuki's we haven't mentioned. Bandits either, have we? The bargain bike of the 90s. We That's never right. mentioned them, did we? Yamaha's Phaser, we didn't mention that. Yeah, another cracking bike. Yeah. Some of BMW's bikes, that yeah. R1100 RS. That's true. The VMAXs, that was a cult bike of the 90s. Now, you know me, I'm always liking the idea of getting into ladies' clothing. But I mean it seriously, I'm talking motorcycle clothing for ladies. So we've come to the expert again. We've come to see Martha at Geared Up at Huddersfield. Because you know your stuff, don't you? How are you doing, Martha? All right. All right, thanks. Good. Well, you've helped us up to now with helmets, boots, gloves, mm -hmm. and so on. We want to get onto this sort of thing right. now. So this is nice, but what I have noticed, it's massive. It must be 46 in there. <laughs> There's some big ladies around here then. Yeah? No, we do ladies, proper ah, ladies in these right, as well. This is a gents. And, and yeah. are they different, or are they just a bit smaller? No, they are specially tailored for women. Right. So they are a really nice shape. Usually arms are a bit shorter, the body might be a bit shorter. But and they don't yeah. cost any more? The same no, price? No, the same price. And yeah, you don't, they yeah. don't lose out on anything? You've still got all the you know, connecting zips Yeah, they things. have, yeah. Right, yeah. We've got jeans as well, which are really good value for money that match the jackets. Yeah. Oh, you can, they're quite interchangeable, so you can get different oh, so jeans like the as well. They all zip will together. Go from different brands will go into different jackets. Usually, not always, yeah. but a lot of them are similar now. All right. And are the jeans? different again are they tailored are they sort of like more elastications here there and everywhere done for the hips and so on they generally seem to be um fitted for women yeah. as well they yeah. are different yeah well, that's good really yeah yeah but ladies don't always want you know i mean the jeans are fine and very often they wear plain ones but the ladies don't always want the multicolored flashy stuff they mm. want basic stuff that really is relatively low cost yeah. so so such things do we exist because we've got one like that here a nice simple plain jacket so I noticed on this one now, the zip is on the opposite side to where the gents would be. That's right. And even though it's a lower cost jacket, is it still uh, shaped and everything? Oh yeah, definitely. Well, you can see here how it goes in at the waist oh, yeah, and comes out yeah, on the hips. Yeah. Lots of elastication. Yeah, it's adjustable at the Loads side. Loads of adjusters here, look. Yeah, yeah. That's smashing, that. Yeah. And I gather you can have plain black trousers with that or whatever. You and can. You can zip them in. Yeah. Oh, they think of everything, and don't they? And women don't end up looking like rugby players. Oh, <laughs> you know, like some of the jackets. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's sensible. Yeah, we've got to look feminine, mm -hmm. haven't we? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But not everybody wants a, a leather, do they? No. Uh, not Certainly if they're going to ride the bike come rain or shine. That's where these babies come into the equation, don't they? The textiles. Because obviously they're windproof, waterproof and everything mm -hmm. else. And I notice that's really nice and petite. So these are sized, small, large and so on. Um, do you find then that, that, that they do accommodate everybody? You know, I mean, is there a full range? There's a full range, particularly in this one, because they do this especially in a lady's jacket as All well. Right. It's available in the men's as well, so you can have like a couple having matching jackets yeah, if yeah, they want. Yeah. And a full choice of colours. Yeah, to match the bike. And this is £150. Yeah. Do you find that ladies do want the longer coats or they go for the sort of bomber jacket style? Either. Uh, yeah, yeah. Matter, really. so the, the variation is yeah, just the, the same. Yeah, and I noticed on this one that they don't skim for anything. It's just exactly the same reflectors and mm. all that lot, yeah. and a bit of back protection. And this one's got full See, armor, in armor. Yeah, in yeah. As well. So yeah. there's no, they don't cut any corners. So if a, a textile jacket was sold like that, presumably then it would be trousers that they'd want in textile, yeah. like that. 
Not, not always. Sometimes I still prefer to wear the jeans, really, yeah, but yeah, if you want yeah. textile trousers, yeah. you can get these. Yeah. Uh, any others? We've got especially some ladies ones down there as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. This, this, this one. I know that are done in leg length. Do you find that is a big requirement? Because of course, uh, somebody might be uh, slightly wide around the waist or wherever, but not necessarily particularly tall. Mm. So short legged would be needed so that the knee pads are in the right place that's on the right knee yeah and not too far down the leg so you can get them yeah these these come in a uh, short leg yeah, yeah regular and long leg as well so they accommodate everybody yeah yeah uh, yeah and they well these are 120 quid and they have the detachable liner and everything they else are, to go with yeah. them so so basically in a nutshell everybody is catered for ladies tall short Fat, That's slim, right. <laughs> and all the gents. Everybody's yeah. catered for. Yeah. It's just a question of going to the shop and finding what is available. Yeah. That's great. Now, I know that, I noticed this earlier on when I was looking around your shop for some of the gear. You've done nice little passionate things that you've obviously taken note of. You've done this mm. where it is a size 12, but you've wrote on it very small fitting. So you've obviously found this out yeah. from your own experience. So you're saving people trying all the gear on. You can say, look, love. You might be a 12 normally, but these are too small for you, yeah, whatever. Yeah. That's great. You do yeah. other things, though, don't you? You don't just stick to, well, to regular lines. We try and be as helpful as possible. Um, we don't hard sell. You know, we want people, to, customers to come in and spend a lot of time. You know, we don't rush people. You know, it takes a while to try things on. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they can yeah. take as long as they want. We want people to be happy. Yeah. And come you find back and you find if it's a lady who's new to biking, or she only just goes on the back of a hood, mm. or something like that, do you find then they want to try and keep the cost down, maybe? Yeah, that's true. Definitely. What do you do to address so, that? So um, we sell secondhand stuff as well. Oh yeah. So, well, yeah. we do a small range. Yeah. Um, it helps people, you know, when people are starting up and they can't afford to spend a lot of money. Yeah, it's a good stepping stone, yeah, isn't it? They can try it all out, yeah. and if they do like it and they yeah, want to stick to biking right. or yeah. whatever, they mm -hmm. get some new gear at a later mm -hmm. day. Well, thanks very much, Martha. Now, I've learnt an awful lot over the last few weeks, and I'm sure our viewers have as well, and the ladies have been very grateful knowing there is a bit of kit for them. So keep up the good work so that they know where to come for mm -hmm. the stuff. But meanwhile, I just want to address <laughs> that thing again. What about trying this, you know, measuring the inside leg? Is there any chance? <laughs> well, if you don't ask, you don't get. But after the break, Jeff has some ideas for a winter bike. And we've some very important news for those of you watching through an analogue system. Winter, eh? Not really the time for motorbikes, is it? If you're perfectly honest. I mean, today the sun's out and I can just about see the old camera there. But really, the roads get pretty cruddy, covered in mud and they even get salt. So perhaps you need something more like a dual-purpose bike? How about this, Aprilia's Pegaso, 650cc, four valve engine, all mud cons, electric start and all the rest of it of course, but it does allow you to get a more upright riding position and is more suited to iffy conditions as far as the road goes. Up at the front here, big 19 inch wheel for good navigation, it's got multi-purpose tyres, you know road and off-road, but they're not truly knobbly. Got a disc brake, single disc brake at the front, single disc at the rear, perfectly adequate for the job. Stainless steel spokes, so that'll get you through all the cruddy weather without corroding. They're straight pull as well, just like real competition ones. Forks have got these um, covers on the front from the front guards to keep all the crud off them. Big radiator there. Even got a bash plate there, just to protect you if you do go off-road, like I'm on this pile of stones here. But to be honest, as I say, they're not really suited for it. They're a bit heavy for it. But it looks pretty trick. It's got a nice twin exhaust system, even though it's a single cylinder engine. It's even got two carburetors as well, but that's for the four valve breathing. In fact, that engine is in fact really a Rotax engine, the Austrian Rotax engine, but uh, Aprilia have redesigned it for their purposes. You get a little fairing on it, which isn't bad. It's really a cosmetic cover for the radiator, but it's got this little bit to keep the blast off it. You've got some hand protectors there, which aren't really to keep the weather off you, but to stop your fingers being smashed on branches as you go flying past, or perhaps not. Um, mirrors, instrumentation, all pretty basic stuff. So just how much is this all-rounder going to cost you? Well, would you believe this one is looking pretty good in the sunlight, and in fact it is pretty good. I'm the one who's covered it all in mud, but it cost you £2,300. It's a 95 on an end plate, but it really is a cracker. It's pretty good value at this time of year in all this crud. Just the job. Sitting upright on the Pegaso certainly gives you a commanding riding position, all the better for dealing with those wintry lanes. 
The engine has enough punch for anyone in these conditions and with that sit-up position, speeding is not going to be much of a worry. Yes, it'll do around 90 mile an hour flat out, but boy would you know it at the end of the day. Far better to chuff along enjoying the scenery. But the Pegaso is not the only soft roader in this game. There's this Suzuki Freewing for instance. Very, very similar, isn't it? Look, there's all this plastic on it. Very, very similar. No big cowling around the radiator because that's quite simple. It hasn't got one. It's got an oil cooler, but no big radiator because this is an air-cooled motor. Still a 650, still four valve, single cylinder, nice simple motor, bags of torque. Now up the front, again, very, very similar because here you've got these dual purpose tires again. If I turn the bars a little bit and I don't lose my lid, you can also see stainless steel spokes, again, that straight pull and a big single disc. Now, as you can see on this one, there's no hand guards, but then again, in an urban environment, you don't really need them, do you? There aren't many branches that you're gonna smack your fingers. But while we're up here talking about urban environments, a nice modern digital display there, speedo and fuel gauge, looks very high tech. And I think it makes this bike a bit more urban than the Aprilia. And you know, all this, it makes a more sort of cosmopolitan look and a cosmopolitan feel to the thing. Now, to go along with this massive seat, you've got an equally massive carrier, ideal for sticking your luggage on the back there and tying it down securely. And on this side, you've got another massive thing, a stainless steel silencer. But then again, this is a bike for an urban environment. And how much for this urban warrior? Well, this is a 98 and it could cost you just 2009, which again, isn't bad, is it? Personally, I found the free wind offered a better ride than the Pegaso. Somehow I just felt more part of the bike. Certainly in an urban environment where these bikes spend a lot of their time, you've probably got more presence than a head down sports bike. They're easy to handle around town, easy to see what's coming and easy for people to see you too. Controls fall easily to hand and foot for that matter, allowing you to get on with the battle through the urban jungle. But if you don't fancy either of these bikes, BMW also have a soft roader in the guise of the F650. Again, very similar, 650cc, single cylinder, easy to ride, and like all of these bikes, relatively cheap to insure. Now, there's no hand guards on this one, but who's worrying in an urban environment? There aren't many trees around here, are there? I mean, so that there's one or two down there, but there's not many branches that are going to smack your fingers. While we're up here, this dashboard is a digital one on this, so that looks very trick, very modern. And I think this bike is that little bit more cosmopolitan, which I think I've actually said once before, but now we've cut and feeling and farted about. I'm not quite sure. Go on, go again. No, where did we end up, Ty? I can't remember. This is absolutely frigging hopeless. This is hopeless, this is. Hopeless, hopeless. Ready? Yes, right. Well, here we are in now. I'll do it properly. I'm going to prat about. Okay. okay. Now, as you can see on this one, there's no actual hand guards, but then again, you don't really need any when you're in an urban environment and there's no branches to smack your fingers. But anyway, while we're up here, you've got a nice digital. Going on again. Good practice. Hopeless tie. I'm going to explode in a minute, mate. This is a disaster. Right, I want you to forget Jeff's useful tips bit, all right? This is Wayne's useful tip bit. This is Wayne's useful tip bit for these. An analog satellite dish. I've got some great ideas to what you can use this for. Now you could use it for a wheel trim if somebody's already nicked yours. Cause it, it fits, um, or maybe not. Now, if it's snowing in your region at the moment, you might want to use one as an umbrella. Like that. Oh dear, it's got holes in. Maybe not. Now, I've got an absolutely fantastic idea, because you could use this as a sledge. Or oh, maybe not. Now then. With a micro scooter and a satellite analog dish, you could indeed form a stunt. This could be used as the wall of death. 
because or maybe not kids kids be careful don't do this at home it could be dangerous so what am I cattling on about you ask eh well fun over now the serious bit I do like to be serious this an analog satellite dish is indeed redundant we need to make room for one of these a digital system and any other form of digital system because soon that is in February the old two wheels program and the men and motors set up is going to be on digital so you need some form of digital reception and receiver and also just for those people out there who do whinge a bit whenever they meet Paul Jeff and myself and say eh, when's two wheels going to be on a bit earlier well we've sorted the job out for you because as in February when it goes on digital then you'll be able to view two wheels at 10 30 on a Sunday evening and again at 9 30 on a Wednesday evening so we've tried to accommodate everything better programs on digital at better times what more could you ask for now I need to just move on a bit here because I've got to finish off a job that I started earlier. I wish you all the best. Best of viewing for the new year. Happy New Year. Oh, I want to finish it off. Oh. Right, I want you to forget Jeff's useful tips, all right? And this is Wayne's useful tips. I'm going to show you lots of useful things to do with this. An analogue satellite... satellite, satellite <laughs> <laughs> yes indeed eh? I should have fall <laughs> well that didn't look anything like Wayne's handwriting to me and on two wheels next week Jeff travels to the National Motorcycle Museum and takes a look back at over 100 years of the British bike also next week Wayne takes a look behind the scenes at a modern motorcycle superstore <laughs>